Welcome. My name is Stefan Auer. I'm director of the Innovative Universities European Union Center at La Trobe University, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our La Trobe University Symposium today, Does Social Democracy Have a Future? Making predictions, it's a tricky business. Historians and social scientists are pretty good at predicting the past, though they often get that wrong too. <laughs> Think of this very recent example, 2008, at the height of the global financial crisis, leading public intellectuals and even some prime ministers predicted or wrote about the demise of neoliberalism. The GFC was meant to bring about the end of global capitalism as we know it. Kevin Rudd, the fiscal conservative, became Rudd, the social democrat. America was out because of its commitment to neoliberalism and Europe was in because of its commitment to a European social model. Like a smoker who claimed there was nothing easier than to give up smoking, for he had done it so many times, <laughs> neoliberalism or liberalism was proclaimed dead far too often. How fast times are changing. Two years later, it seems that the European social model is dying. Our colleague from Sydney University, John Keane, wrote an article recently entitled Farewell to Social Democracy. And the great British historian, late Tony Judd, wrote a masterpiece about uh, social democracy, Ill Fares the Land. Both writers characteristically looked to the past and had little optimism to present for the future. Suddenly, it became more relevant to talk about the end of social democracy. And social democracy is struggling in Europe right now. Their supporters despair at the fact that the economic crisis benefited conservative parties more than those on the left, to the extent that social democrats tend to be addicted to high levels of public spending, the sovereign debt in Europe is a major challenge uh, for them. It is much easier for conservatives to cut spending. This is why the crisis of the Eurozone is turning into a crisis of the European welfare state. Can the European model survive the crisis of the Eurozone? People are even asking whether the EU itself can survive. Can principle of solidarity, the principle of solidarity, work against the background of unsustainable public debt? These are the issues that social democrats have to ponder if they are serious about the commitment to both liberty and social solidarity. For if solidarity doesn't go beyond the bureaucratic distribution of people's resources here and now, then we are in trouble, never mind what the future holds. We cannot talk about solidarity but the institutionalized theft of the current generation at the expense of generations to come. This is, to me, one of the many meanings of the crisis of sovereign debt. As Tony Judd reminds us, social democrats need to take seriously the classic pledge by Edmund Burke, not a social democrat by any means, that the society is indeed a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. Now, I don't know what my colleagues on the panel will say about the future of social democracy, but I'm sure that one of the panelists, my colleague and dear friend Robert Mann, would take Burke's concern as seriously as I do. It is consistent with his consistently conservative, progressive outlook. As many of you would know, Robert has been in the midst of a number of crucial debates in Australia about what is left of the left. And when the opportunity arose to host one of the key thinkers of the left from Germany, Professor Wolfgang Merkel, Robert didn't need persuading that this will be an important event, and his Ideas and Society program at La Trobe University has uh, staged it. So the only problem that we had was that we were not sure whether the Australian educated public, what the Germans call Bildungsbürgertum, <laughs> would share our passion for this topic in the middle of hot summer. So I'm delighted to see that, yes, you are as interested as we are, and that we have more people in the audience than on our distinguished uh, panel. <laughs> Let me introduce our distinguished presenters. Our discussant is Professor Marilyn Lake, my colleague from La Trobe University, the recipient of this year's Prime Minister Literary Award for Nonfiction for her monograph drawing 
the global line. Professor Jeff Gallup, a former premier from Western Australia and director of the Graduate School of Government at Sydney University. And as I mentioned already, Professor Wolfgang Merkel from the Humboldt University in Berlin, who has produced extensive research on social democracy in Europe and Latin America. He is also director of uh, uh, a department in the Social Science Research Center in Berlin, and he also advises, as I just found out very recently, the Spanish Prime Minister uh, Zapatero. So he's also engaged in, in, uh, open, in, in, in political debates there directly. And, of course, Professor Robert Mann from La Trobe University, as I mentioned. Now, the format we, we uh, adopted is pretty straightforward. We asked uh, Professor Merkel to start the discussion with a short uh, presentation, then uh, Professor uh, Jeff Gallup will follow, Robert Mann will follow, and Marilyn uh, will uh, raise a couple of questions. And then we are keen to hear also your contributions. We want to have some time for questions and answers from the audience. So may I invite uh, Professor Wolfgang Merkel to, to start our conversation tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Predictions indeed are risky. There's a famous saying of a German comedian. He said, predictions are risky, especially if they look into the future. As Stefan already pointed out, it was only one year ago that a famous essay has been published by the late Tony Chutt. The title was, What is Living?, and what is dead in social democracy. I very briefly quote him. He wrote, in the last three decades, a cult of privatization mesmerized Western governments. We are entering a new age of insecurity. If social democracy has a future, it will be a social democracy of fear. Social Democrats have to remind their audience of the achievements of the 20th century, along with the likely consequences of our heedless rush to dismantle them. Among the numerous challenges social democracy is facing at present, I want to mention three, and I want briefly to discuss them. First, after all these electoral defeats, social democracy has to find winning electoral coalitions and has to recreate a solid social base for his success in the 21st century. And the most recent advices we can hear, and we can hear these advices also here in your country, in Australia, is that social democrats should transform their program into a red-green program with a particular focus on ecological question. I will call this the green advice. Second, social democracy has to adopt its program and policies to the needs of an individualized society. The challenge of globalization has to be faced as well. There are recommendations today that civil society should play a major role and not the state, which is a matter of the 20th century. I will call this the communitarian advice. Third, social democracy has to defend the achievements of the post-war welfare state as it has been outlined by Tony Chutt. I will call this the defensive advice. Very briefly, a critical review of these three advices. The green advice. Social democratic, or the social democratic economic credo of the 20th century was economic growth cum redistribution. Social Democrats of the 21st century 
should not, and this is what I think, should not succumb to the green temptation to leave the path of economic growth. Growth is not everything, but without growth, everything is nothing. This is particularly true for left parties who are striving for a more equal society and represent not at least the interests of the less privileged. A retreat from the goal of economic growth would especially harm the lower third of our societies. It can be a successful avenue for green parties who mostly represent, and this is a decisive difference, who mostly uh, represent the well-educated middle classes, but it is certainly not uh, the typical clientele of social democrats. Economic growth of the most advanced economies of the 21st century will be anyway not driven that much by a carbon uh, energy, but will be cleaner and will be more sensitive to the environment. So social democracy should not simply copy the politics and policies of the Greens, not at least Germany shows that this is a risky strategy for social democrats. They engaged in a coalition on the federal level between 1998 and 2005, and it paid for the Greens. Uh, the social democrats made them a party which is able to govern, and they governed mostly the less complicated portfolios, never social policy, never uh, the Ministry of fin Finance. The second advice was the communitarian advice, more civil society, less state. I argue social democracy has to rediscover the state. The le legislative and executive power of the state is crucial for the production of collective goods, for a prosperous and for a just society. The state has to utilize the considerable national space for policy making which still exists despite the ongoing globalization. But beyond the nation state, social democracy must also be more active in forming international alliances and supranational regimes and neglecting these uh, supranational politics has been some of the mistake of the so-called third way of the past 15 years. So uh, my advice is social democracy has to play a kind of two-level game on the national and international level, meaning on the international level they have to come back to a certain regulation of the financial sector. On the national level they have to be keen that they interrupt this bad old game that, private, that the public debts and losses uh, getting socialized and all the benefits and profits still get privatized. So globalization should be more actively shaped than it has been done by social demo uh, democrats in the past. The state and its basic functions should not be usurped by civil society. Civil society relies heavily on cognitive resources which we find especially among the middle classes. Therefore, civil society is very much a domain of the better educated and the better off. Civil society can only complement the representative democratic state but should never substitute the state's guaranteeing function, which is, by the way, always the advice of neoliberal and libertarian politicians and thinkers alike. Proponents of the civil society are critical 
against traditional representative democracy and propagate, propagate more and more direct, the direct involvement of the citizens, meaning propagating referenda on special political issue. They argue for more direct democracy, for more referenda. This sounds, at least on a theoretical and normative level, very convincing, convincing to me as well. But in reality, this is not without unintended consequences. I argue that referenda and other forms of direct democracy do not simply strengthen the people. They specifically favor the interests of the middle classes. If you look to the countries where you have many of these referenda, like in Switzerland or in California, and now increasingly also in Germany, uh, they turned out to be an instrument to defend privileges of the haves versus the have-nots. And it's quite interesting if you compare, for example, the participation of the people in general elections and in referenda. Even in general election, the lower classes do not vote very often. They simply abstain, not in these few countries where you have a compulsory uh, vote. Right, but you don't find this, for example, in Europe. You have it in Belgium, but it's never sanctioned. So even in Belgium, you have only 80%. And then in many countries, goes down. In Switzerland, for example, to 45%. Only 45% of the people are voting. And Switzerland is something uh, considered as being the homeland of uh, of democracy. But what we see that not only the lower classes do not go to these referenda, uh, uh, the results of the referenda are not very progressive. It is always against taxes. The famous Proposition 68 brought California close to bankruptcy. It is in Switzerland very xenophobic. They uh, uh, now, through a referendum, they forbid the, form, the further building of mosques there. And in Germany, it was a defense of a very middle-class privileging system of education. Uh, so referenda are a tricky thing, which I am more and more skeptical if I look to the reality. I come to the last point, the defensive advice this is what Tony Chat has called the politics of fear. Defending uh, the achievements of the past, I do agree this is right, but it does not suffice the, to secure the future for social democracy. I think social democrats have to reach out into the future and their programs have to provide guidance for the presence as well. Social Democrats have to revive optimism for a better future, but it should not avoid the trade-off social democratic parties are and will be confronted with. Social democratic policies in the 21st century still need, and I already said this, still need a strong tax state and a dynamic but activating welfare state. Social democratic politics should strengthen public services instead of simply monetary transfers. They should improve physical and social security. In sum, social democracy need a reliable, enabling state that empowers the citizens. The core of social democratic, the social democratic vision, I think, even in the 21st century, has to be social justice. This is a typical distinction between social democracy and the Greens. And I also argue there are already philosophical thoughts of the 20th century which can inspire these kind of dem uh, social democratic policies. And I just mentioned three of them. There, U.S. American philosopher John Rawls was talking about a fair society, 
By a fair society, he meant nobody can anything uh, or nobody who is born in rich or poor relations, nobody who is intelligent or stupid, nobody who is attractive or ugly, and uh, should be have an award for this or should be punished for it. Therefore, a just society has to create institutions to compensate for disadvantages where the people are not responsible for. So against the scandalous lottery, as he calls it, of nature and society, institutions have to be created to create a fair society. But I do think this is not enough. And the Nobel Prize winner in economics, Amartya Sen, was reminding us it is all about the citizens, the empowerment of citizens. And a guaranteeing enabling state has to empower citizens with capabilities. And these capabilities should help them to find their own life chances. So equal life chances is something which is quite important. And even the best social democratic countries and governments which we find in Scandinavia are still far away from such a fair society. But even Sen and Rawls is not enough, and Martha Nussbaum reminds us that there is happiness cannot be reached alone by material goods, by consumerism. It is important, this distributional issue, and it will be important in our unequal capitalist societies, but a good society cannot be reduced to these material distribution alone. It must be made clear that consumerism fake, sorry, fails to offer deeper meaning to human lives. Happiness cannot be attained only by constantly rising incomes, even if they are more equally distributed as they are now. A good society should guarantee people sufficient time for a vita contemplativa, using an Aristotle term, time for family and friends, and a well-preserved environment or Lebenswelt, life world, which is protected from the productivist and economist colonization of the system world as the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas has put it. Nevertheless, and I come to the end, nevertheless, individuality is a normative imperative since the time of enlightenment. It is even more relevant for the 21st century than it has been 200 years ago. It should not be sacrificed to diffuse communitarian values at least not beyond what the liberal philosopher John Stuart Mill has defined as the limits of an individual liberty. The plurality of lifestyles and the spectrum of choices have to be created and have to be protected for the citizens. However, they have to be made compatible with social cohesion and solidarity. This is not only true in the realm of socioeconomic inequalities, but must also be acknowledged in the fields of immigration. Immigration will be an increasing feature of our societies in the future, but ethnic and religious diversity need to be governed. Otherwise, it will foster what we see now in Europe, xenophobic tendencies. We see it in Europe, we see it in your country as well, we see it elsewhere. Immigration and integration policies should equally balance rights, duties, and opportunities. If social democrats do not fully recognize this, they will exacerbate an emerging new cleavage which one can call on the one side, uh, you find cosmopolitan elites. On the other side, you find the losers of globalization, those who are still in parochial nationalist 
values. The state has to be secular. This is my firm conviction, or at least has to be neutral when it comes to ethnical and religious rights. However, the plurality of these rights must find its limits at the point where it violates the imperatives of freedom, equality, and the rule of law. Only then there will be an opportunity to preserve and create social capital and cohesion. So at the end, is there a winning coalition for social democracy in sight? The answer is probably not. Social democracy has to forge social alliances and form political majorities for such an ambitious program, no doubt. Trade unions have to be part of it, but also civic associations and social movements such as ATTAC, such as Transparency International, Human Rights Watch, and environmental organizations. These alliances will be more pluralistic, more colorful, and precarious than they were in the 20th century. The present century will be more turbulent for social democracy. There are no strong signs that it will be again a social democratic one. But at its beginning, social democracy is still strong enough to be a vital force to stimulate, formulate, and to organize progressive politics for a fair and sustainable society in the future. If it will be then called social democratic, I do, I do think is of lesser importance. Even if social democracy will not survive in the form of the classical catch-all parties, the substance of its progressive policies will certainly last for the next decades to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, and uh, we very much appreciate your presence in Australia uh, to discuss this most important topic. And can I thank uh, La Trobe University for inviting me uh, down to Melbourne to talk about something uh, that is very, very important. Although I must confess, when I saw the title, Does Social Democracy Have a Future? I was reminded of a wonderful question on a philosophy paper when I was at Oxford. The, the, the question was, is this a question? And someone whom I'm sure went on to become a great hedge fund operator in Britain replied, if it is, this is an answer. But uh, I think if social democracy doesn't have a future, I think we're all in trouble. And when you think about the future, what is it? The future is that which we are trying to manage, the technological changes that sweep through. It's that which we are trying to avoid, most obviously nuclear catastrophe, uh, the climate change and its impact on social, economic and environmental factors. But the future is also that which we attempt to create. And I think uh, we don't want to get too locked in to an analytical approach that takes away the role of political will from the equation. But in order to look at the issue of social democracy, I think it's important to understand its past. And I'll do this very, very quickly. The grand era of social democracy, and I think Wolfgang alluded to it in his own address, was really from the 1940s through to the 1970s. It was what we might describe as a hegemonic force in our community. It led the debate. It reformed and civilised capitalism. In fact, it was an essential bulwark against the alternatives of fascism and communism at the time. It integrated the working class into the democratic state. And it did it by offering them something, offering them equal opportunity in health and education, a proper welfare state, Keynesian techniques of economic management. And as the 1960s developed, its concept of social justice was extended to include all of those new social movements that were coming on uh, to the political stage. The equality of women, law reform in our society, a multiculturalism, uh, the rights for the gay and lesbian people in our community. This was the classic era of social democracy. Social justice, a taming of the market in the interests of all of the people, the creation of a good welfare state, and the liberalising of society 
uh, in what was a very conservative uh, era when it comes to uh, social issues. So it led the way. It was a leading force. But I think if we're going to consider social democracy today, I think we've got to consider this period from about the 1980s uh, through to the turn of the century, when social democracy played a quite different role in our society. This was the era in which communism had collapsed, the era of globalisation, and people were looking at their own jurisdictions in the advanced industrial democratic countries and saying, you know, we need to reform. There's competition, international competition. And of course, many social democratic parties, including our own here in Australia and in New Zealand, in many ways led the way with what we now call microeconomic reform, what we call uh, a deregulation of the economy, with what we might call a, a competitive approach to what creates uh, uh, productivity. And at the same time, all of the benefits that were flowing through from the post-war era weren't translating into a happy society. There were, there were tensions in the community. There were issues about social dysfunction. People feeling that, yes, we had the material welfare, but did we have the good society? Did we have the good life? Thus, we had the values debate came into the equation. And what seemed like a regular and orderly process of change, all of a sudden, within social democracy, there's a debate about values, with social conservatives reviving, if you like, within the ranks of social democracy and making that liberal reform process uh, harder than it was before. And also in putting on the agenda... Tough on crime, social order, making sure society works so that the dysfunctions are being tackled. Inevitably, traditional social democracy of the post-war era lost some of its supporters. Some of the working class said, well, this new competitive economy is all very well, but what about me? Some of the civil libertarians in the social democratic movement said, well, I thought we were libertarians. Why are we tough on crime? Why are we doing these things? Why has the freedom to question become as important as the freedom from question, which was the dominant issue in the 1960s? And so there was a loss of support. Social democracy, it would seem, had become a method rather than a mission. It had become a program around which we brought together different ideas, commercial ideas from the private sector, social order ideas from conservatives, mixed it up with a bit of liberalism, mixed it up with some traditional ideas of uh, uh, redistribution and equal opportunity and created this great mix of things which offered good leadership, but it wasn't the same mission that we had in the post-war era. So that's the context in which we talk about social democracy, I think, as we went into the 21st century, and then climate change emerged. Climate change, of course, is a major issue. Not dealing with climate change will make it even harder for social democrats because the social, the economic and the political consequences of what comes with climate change will make progressive politics all that much harder. So it's not just a case of making sure that climate change is your number one issue in terms of the future of the world, in terms of your own future as a political movement, I think it's most important. So, social democrats had taken on board environmental amenity in the suburbs, nature conservation, but the move to a low carbon economy, that's a big call. That really does affect our interests. That affects the interests of many people who traditionally supported uh, social democrats. Uh, inevitably, the Greens came in and filled a lot of that space that Social Democrats couldn't fill because they didn't have the passion, they didn't have the enthusiasm uh, around these bigger environmental questions. At the same time, the Greens are offering a bigger package. Some of the economic uh, reforms they criticised and said we need to go back to where we were, a more protectionist, a more, if you like, Keynesian type economy with more planning. They also were more libertarian and questioned zero tolerance, questioned uh, the war on drugs, the war on terror. And so a new constituency emerged within the Green Movement. So what about social democracy? It's under pressure. 
It's under pressure from all of these forces. Its traditional base has been, and its membership, as Wolfgang has pointed out in his own works, its membership has also declined. Well, how do we deal with climate change? I think social democracy has a fundamental contribution to make. Climate change has to be managed. Sorry, the politics of climate change have to be managed. What is it about social democracy that gives it an edge in that management process? Well, let's look at the two alternatives. The neoconservative alternative, the conservative alternative. I think the problem there is that within the ranks of the conservatives around the world, there are a lot of climate sceptics. Secondly, the temptation to base their politics on what is the case now and the vested interests involved is very, very strong. And thirdly, there's a real distrust of the role of the state. I don't think we can trust conservatives to take us into a low carbon economy. I wish we could, because if there was an alliance between, if you like, liberal conservatives and social democrats on climate change, so much easier it would be for us to go forward. And didn't we see that in Australia? Just 12 months ago, when we were on the edge of an emissions trading system, with a Liberal leader supporting it, a Labor government supporting it, and it all fell apart, and now we've gone back. And I think that's a good illustration of the problem. 